Hello everyone and welcome to a new lecture in the topic of tachyarrhythm in our ACG course. As we know in the last lecture we discussed approach to why complex tachycardia as a prototype of tachyarrhythmia. But today we are focusing on a subtype of why complex tachycardia which is ventricular tachycardia, the most malignant form of tachyarrhythmia. And so today we are going to learn the mechanisms of ventricular tachycardia and the different ECG features of VT. So we are not focusing today on the other types of white complex tachycardia, which is the antidromic AVRT or the SVT with apparency. Let's of course remind ourselves with the term of ventricular rhythm. We know of course that ventricular rhythm is from its name. It's a rhythm originating from a focus inside the ventricle. Either it is automatic focus by abnormal automaticity, either re-entry or either by triggered activity and according to the rate of this ventricular rhythm we can divide it into three types if the rate is less than 50 beat per minute we call it escape ventricular rhythm is if if it's from 50 to 100 we call it accelerated ventricular rhythm and if it is more than 100 at the time it is a tachyarrhythmia so we call it ventricular tachycardia so the first type is bradyarrhythmia and the last type is tachyarrhythmia while the other type is a specific type of rhythm disorder for which we are giving a dedicated lecture after this of course today we are focusing on ventricular tachycardia we know of course that when we classify tachycardia into narrow complex and wide complex each one of them was divided again into regular and irregular and today we are focusing on this and we focus on this of course as the clinical approach in the last lecture but today we are focusing on the ventricular tachycardia first of all what is the definition of ventricular tachycardia ventricular tachycardia by definition is presence of more than or equal three consecutive ventricular ectopics at a rate of more than 100 beat per minute so at least three consecutive ventricular ectopics is called ventricular tachycardia but if the heart rate is more than 100 because if the heart rate is less than 100 at the time we can call it accelerated edge ventricular rhythm and is not sustained so ventricular triplet which is three consecutive ventricular ectopics alone is considered the shortest run of vt and we can call it non-sustained ventricular tachycardia let's try to divide ventricular tachycardia according to many aspects the first one is classifying it according to the duration of course it is very easy and all of us know it that non-sustained ventricular tachycardia means that there are presence of at least three consecutive ventricular ectopics but terminating spontaneously is in less than 30 seconds and so there is no need for DC shocks of course a patient is non-sustained because it resolves spontaneously so please don't think of DC shocks when you are seeing non-sustained ventricular tachycardia in an ECG strip or on the monitor just we are thinking of the causes of these runs of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia and focusing on the antiarrhythmic medication which can suppress them or just proceed to watchful waiting but no rule of course for DC shocks and so sustained ventricular tachycardia means that there is persistent VT for more than 30 seconds and in most of the cases it needs to be terminated by DC shock and of course we know from the guidelines of European Society of Cardiology for ventricular arrhythmia that VT should be terminated by DC shock regardless of dynamic status because it is considered a malignant type of tachyarrhythmia because it may degenerate into VF and cause sudden cardiac death and that's why VT is considered a malignant arrhythmia and this patient needs admission. Of course, we have another definition called salvo. Salvo is a run of consecutive 3 to 6 PVCs or ventricular ectopics. So, ventricular air triplet is considered a salvo and is considered also non sustained ventricular tachycardia. We don't commonly use the term salvo, but of course, this terminology is written many times in literature and so we need just to be familiar with this so salvo is considered like a form of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia but usually a short run of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia like three to six ventricular ectopics let's now divide ventricular tachycardia according to mechanism according to mechanism of course we know that there are three basic mechanisms for any tachyarrhythmia and this would be applied also in vt Re-entrance, which is just a re-entrance circuit, needs an obstacle in the center and two pathways around it with difference in conduction velocity and in refractory periods. Triggered activity, which can be by early after depolarization or delayed after depolarization. And abnormal automaticity, which means that there is an abnormally automatic focus inside the ventricle here in this example. Of course, 
re-entering tachycardia, of course, needs in this example to have a two pathways. One of them, for example, have shorter refractory period and slower conduction, and the other one has longer refractory period and faster conduction. And so when there is a critically timed premature beat, it is blocked in one of them, and then it passes anti-gradely in the one with the slower conduction and shorter refractory period, and then retrogradely in the first pathway in which it was blocked. This is the basic mechanism of any re-entrant tachycardia. Let's give some examples for re-entrant VT. Of course, the most common example for re-entrant VT is car-related VT. This is the most common time that you will see in your practice. And of course, it occurs in structural heart disease rather than in acute MI. It is characterized by presence of ventricular scar tissue, like for example in ischemic LV dysfunction, dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic or arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy, and this of scar of course gives a substrate for occurrence of free entrant VT, and of course it may degenerate into VF, resulting in sudden cardiac death. So scar-related VT is the most common presentation of VT. Fascicular VT, of course, was discussed in the last lecture. Fascicular VT, from its name, is a type of VT which is dealing with the fascicles, which are the branches of the left bundle branch. And so it is a pure ventricular tachycardia inside the left ventricle. And that's why its old name was idiopathic left ventricular tachycardia. But, of course, its more common name is fascicular VT. Fascicular VT is characterized by presence of something called verapamil sensitive zone, which is an area of slow conduction in which the impulse pass anti-gradely and then retrogradely through one of the two fascicles. Of course, the most common fascicle to be involved is posterior fascicle in nearly 95% of cases, leading to a re-entrant circuit inside the left ventricle, and that's why its old name was idiopathic left ventricle. Of course, because it is in the left ventricle, it would lead to typical right bundle branch block morphology, and in most of the cases, it will lead to left axis deviation. So, it is a re-entrant mechanism. It occurs in structurally normal heart, so this patient would have normal echocardiography and normal cardiac MRI. It is more common in young males. It shows typical right bundle branch block morphology, and we discussed before that is one of the famous exceptions to the VT, because of course, that no, we know that VT mostly show atypical bundle branch block morphology but in this example because this VT originate inside the Hesperkinji system in this case it would show typical right bundle branch block morphology with the normal RSR dash patterns that we know and of course because it is originating from left ventricle so it would be right bundle not left bundle and of course one of the other criteria is that it is relatively narrower than the classic pattern of VT so it is not very wide like in the classic pattern of for example scar related VT or VT occurring in acute MI and here the posterior fascicle is involved in 95% of cases leading to left axis deviation but when the anterior fascicle is involved in about 5% or less than 5% of the cases in this case it would show right axis deviation it's of course sensitive to calcium channel blocker therapy and this is another exception to the VT because of course we know that calcium channel blocker is contraindicated in patients with ventricular tachycardia but here because of presence of the verabamin sensitive zone which is the area of slow conduction in the re-entrant circuits it could be terminated by IV verapamil and sometimes the oral medication of calcium channel blocker like verapamil or deltism could suppress or reduce the recurrence of fascicular VT of course, we know it is amenable for ablation and one of the very good types of VT in which the ablation has high success rate. Of course, also we discussed the bundle branch re-entrant tachycardia, which is a re-entrant circuit involving the two bundle branches, the left and right. So it is a re-entrant mechanism and usually occurs in patients with ischemic LV dysfunction or dilated cardiomyopathy, especially those with Hesperkinji system delay, and may degenerate, of course, into VF, resulting in sudden cardiac death. And so bundle branch re-entrant VT is one of the malignant forms of VT that may result in sudden cardiac death in a myopathic patient. Of course, it is important to recognize, and it is easy to recognize, as in most of the cases, it involves the right bundle branch as the anti-grade limb, and the left bundle branch as the retrograde limb, resulting in typical left bundle branch block morphology. But in less than, in few cases, when it is vice versa, it uses the right bundle as the retrograde limb, whereas the left bundle as the anti-grade limb, it will result in typical right bundle branch block morphology. Of course, it is amenable for ablation by ablating the right bundle branch 
uh, inside the heart. And so bundle branch reentrant VT is important to recognize in the practice because in this case, I would not give this patient just medication as we do in this correlated VT. No, I would proceed directly for ablating the right bundle branch and it is something very easy and has a high success rate. Of course, we know that the third mechanism, second mechanism, I'm sorry, for ventricular tachycardia is the triggered activity. And we have two subtypes of triggered activities, early after depolarization and delayed after depolarization. So early after depolarization is characterized by after depolarization occurring early, nearly as the end of phase three, whereas delayed usually start after the end of phase three or during phase four. Let's start with early after depolarization. The two common examples are lung QT syndrome and Brady dependent VT, or sometimes it's called pose dependent VT. Let's start with lung QT syndrome. It's characterized by prolonged repolarization, which results in something called prolongation of the TDR. We remember from the lecture of ECG terminologies that TDR is standing for the transmural dispersion of repolarization, which is a time interval from the peak of the T wave till the end of the T wave. And so this prolongation increases the liability to early after depolarization, which may result in to polymorphic VT on top of this long QT, resulting in something called torsad de poids. And so long QT syndrome is one of the causes of sudden cardiac deaths. It can be genetic, like in forms of channelopathies, dealing with sodium, potassium, or calcium channelopathies, or acquired, like in iatrogenic cases, electrolyte disorders, hypothermia, cerebrovascular accidents, and other causes for long QT syndrome. Of course, we have another type, which is called Brady dependent, or sometimes it's called post-dependent VT. And of course, we remember this fact which is the slower the heart rate, the longer the repolarization. And so it makes sense that with bradycardia, the liability to early after depolarization would be increased like the same mechanism for long QT syndrome. And so liability for polymorphic VT increase, which may result in VF and sudden cardiac deaths. And so bradyarrhythmias like, for example, advanced AV block mob type two or third degree or escape rhythm may result in VT. And in this case, the patient doesn't need need antiarrhythmic medication or rate controlling medication, he just needs pacing by temporary pacemaker which may abolish this VT. And so this type of VT is important to recognize because the treatment here is focusing on treatment of the cause which is the bradyarrhythmia itself. When you abolish the bradyarrhythmia, you abolish the main mechanism for VT in this example. And so these types need to be recognized. Then dealing with the delayed after depolarization, it can occur in idiopathic VT, disruption toxicity, catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, and sometimes in ischemic or reperfusion injury. Idiopathic VT, from its name, it is VT of an unknown cause, but actually we know the cause. It is something related to triggered activity caused by delayed after depolarization, and usually it is single focus inside the heart in most of the cases, and so sometimes we call it focal VT. It is a type of VT occurring in structurally normal heart arising from a single focus, and the most common origin, of course, is the right ventricular outflow tract, or the RVOT. It is usually starting as idiopathic VT that can sustain to form sustained VT, and when you have echocardiography in this patient, you would show unremarkable study. It usually responds to calcium channel blockers, to flickenite, and sometimes, of course, to beta blockers, and because it is focal VT in structurally normal heart, it is amenable to ablation and the success rate would be high, especially with VT originating from RVOT. The drugs and toxicity, of course, would have a dedicated lecture in the ACG course. But briefly, of course, the drugs and toxicity result in increase of intracellular calcium concentration, and so it increased liability to all types of ventricular arrhythmia via delayed after depolarization. And of course, its characteristic pattern is the bidirectional VT, which we would see here today. Catecholaminergic polymorphic VT is a form of channelopathy which is usually caused by increased sensitivity of reanodine receptors to the calcium influx in phase 2 of action potential, leading to increase in intracellular calcium concentration, and sometimes in autosomal recessive case it is caused by calcium mutation. The problem with these types of catecholaminergic VT is that it results in exercise-induced VT. So this patient would have a pattern of syncope occurring only during exertion, 
whereas his resting ECG is normal, his echocardiography is normal. And usually his exercise induced VT present in the form of bidirectional or polymorphic VT. So catecholaminergic polymorphic VT is a form of channelopathy that is usually diagnosed by treadmill test rather than resting ECG or by echocardiography. So catecholaminergic VT is one of the very famous cause for triggered activity. And abnormal automaticity, of course, is one of the mechanisms that may result in ventricular tachycardia. And the most common example is ischemic injury and reperfusion injury. Of course, when we hear these terms, these terms occur in acute MI. And also, it is usually related to retriggered activity in some cases. So ischemic injury and reperfusion injury can result in VT via abnormal automaticity and in some cases via triggered activity. So these two mechanisms can explain VT in this case. And here, if you see an example here, when this patient develops acute MI with thrombus occluding the artery, and so this ischemic injury can result in the abnormal automaticity in this region, and sometimes it may result in triggered activity. And then when the patient has reperfusion either by stenting or either by thrombolytic, the sudden reperfusion to this artery and to this region can result as well into reperfusion arrhythmia one of the common examples for reperfusion arrhythmia though not the most common but one of the common presentation to have vt so reperfusion injury can result in chest pain and can result as well in reperfusion arrhythmias like sinus bradycardia like accelerated edge ventricular rhythm and like vt let's now divide the ventricular tachycardia according to morphology of course, the most common morphology pattern of ventricular tachycardia is monomorphic VT, and from its name, monomorphic means that it shows just one morphology, so it shows similar morphology throughout all the complexes, and it is usually regular. Like here, for example, we can see here that the patient has white complex tachycardia, mostly it is ventricular tachycardia, and in this case, it is monomorphic, as the complex shows the same morphology and regular rhythm. So this is monomorphic VT. We have another example called polymorphic VT and another example also called bleomorphic VT. Of course, many of you now get confused. What's the difference between polymorphic and bleomorphic? In order to understand this, let's just focus on something called etymology, which is the origin of the word. The word or the prefix poly is from an ancient Greek word which means many. Whereas bleo is also from an ancient Greek word, but it means more, more than one. So polymorphic means that I have multiple things or many things, but bleo means more than one thing. So polymorphic VT means that there is continuously changing axis and or morphology, and so you will see multiple complex morphology, and of course the rhythm would be irregular and this usually occurs in case of acute MI, long QT interval and electrolyte disorders like hypokalemia or hypocalcemia. Whereas pleomorphic VT means that there is more than one distinct complex morphology during the same episode but not continuously changing so you would not see multiple or many morphology, you may see two or three morphology during the VT run and this usually occurs with scar related VT. So, for example, here, we can see that this is not monomorphic, as the morphology of the complex is not the same, and it shows at least three distinct morphology, and the rhythm is slightly irregular, so this is bleomorphic VT. Whereas here, we can see multiple and multiple morphologies, like more than five morphology, and the axis is slightly different throughout the run, so this is polymorphic VT. Polymorphic VT can be subdivided into two subtypes, which is polymorphic VT with normal QT interval and polymorphic VT with prolonged QT interval. Here, for example, we can see here in this ACG that here we can see that there is multiple morphology, but the axis is nearly the same. There is slight difference, but it's usually positive. So here it is mostly a type of polymorphic VT on top of normal QT interval. This usually occurs in case of myocardial ischemia, structural heart disease, and channelopathies other than long QT syndrome. So here, for example, there is another case in which the patient has polymorphic VT, but the axis is changing. We can see here that the complex are sometimes negative and sometimes 
positive. So here, of course, as well, we can see that there is in this blue arrow that there is prolonged QT interval in the resting ECG or the resting sinus rhythm before developing VT. So here I have a pattern of polymorphic VT with continuously changing of the axis and also the sinus rhythm shows evidence of prolonged QT interval. So this is polymorphic VT with long QT, we mean to reset the point. To reset the point of course is a French word called in twisting and point is also a French word meaning points. And so to set the point means twisting of point, which means that there is a polymorphic VT with continuously changing of the axis. So here, for example, if we draw an imaginary line here, for example, we can see that sometimes the complex are negative, sometimes they are positive, and so we have rapid irregular QRS complex twisting around the ECG baseline. This is called to set the point, which is a subtype of VT characterized by a polymorphic VT with long QT interval. We would have a dedicated lecture for Tursat de Poix because it is a very important type and very malignant type of VT that means that the patient is in a critical situation and needs rapid intervention to prevent development of recurrent Tursat and may result in VF and sudden cardiac death. There is another complex morphology or morphological pattern of VT in which we can see here there are two morphologies coming on alternate Beats. So just two morphologies alternate with each other, it is called the bidirectional VT. As the same here in this example, we can see peat to peat alternate alteration of the frontal QRS axis. And so the complex morphology differs and the complex axis differs, but on alternate beat. So when I see this example, it is called bidirectional VT. It is not polymorphic or playmorphic. And it is very common with the drugs in toxicity and with catecholaminergic polymorphic VT. So whenever you see this pattern, it is bidirectional VT and you should suspect one of these two conditions. Let's then divide VT into another form or another classification, which is a hemodynamics. Of course, VT can present in two forms, but this is a clinical diagnosis rather than ECG differentiation. It can present in hemodynamically stable form, in which the patient is hemodynamically perfused. So, presence of VT doesn't mean that the patient should be shocked. No, he can be hemodynamically stable and perfused. But of course, in many other cases, the patient can be hemodynamically unstable and shocked. Of course, both need immediate termination by DC shock, but hemodynamically unstable is a more critical situation, and of course, it needs more rapid intervention and needs tailoring long-term treatment due to high risk of mortality. So in most of the structural heart disease, when you read the management in the guidelines, you would say that the management differs according to the patient developed hemodynamically stable VT or he developed hemodynamically unstable VT. And you would usually see that the hemodynamically unstable VT is usually put in the same category as VF regarding long-term management, for example, needing ICD implantation. So VT can be hemodynamically stable and he can be shot. Of course, we remember the ECG criteria of Y complex A cardia that the heart rate needs to be more than 100 because it's tachycardia and Y complex and so the complex is more than 120 milliseconds. And we learned before the different criteria using the Progada, the Reiki criteria, and other assisting criteria to differentiate Y complex A cardia, especially in differentiating VT from SVT with apparency. And let's remind ourselves with the ACG criteria that suggest ventricular tachycardia. AV dissociation, which is very important criteria that once you see a dissociation between the complex and P wave, you should suspect VT. Capture beat, which in which you could see just one or more beats in which there is intermittent capture of the ventricle by the SA node. So you would see a narrow complex inside the VT run. Fusion beat, in which there is a hybrid complex because of fusion between a ventricular beat and a supraventricular beat, and so it suggests ventricular tachycardia rather than SVT. Then we have a typical morphology, and we explained this in detail in the last lecture, that VT in most of the cases, because there are some exceptions, would show a typical left bundle or right bundle branch block morphology. RSR dash complex in case of right bundle, of course, would show taller initial R wave, which is called the left rapid ear sign, because the initial R is taller than the second R. And so this pattern is suggestive of VT, which is called left rapid ear. 
Positive or negative concordance, although they are not very common, but when you see them in an ECG, of course, it is very suggestive of VT, especially the negative concordance, which is the first criterion in the Progata algorithm. Positive concordance, maybe VT, and maybe antidromic AVRT using left sided accessory pathway. Left bundle more than 160 millisecond or right bundle more than 140 millisecond. And we explained before why the ventricular tachycardia is usually wider in the complex duration than the SVT with apparency in general. Extreme axis deviation, meaning that the axis in the right upper quadrant is suggested for ventricular tachycardia. Prugada sign and Josephson sign, which we explained before, related to the morphology of the left bundle branch block in VT. Let's then terminate our lecture by peculiar terminologies related to VT. Slow VT is a very common terminology that is used in clinical practice, and some may confuse slow VT with IVR, although it is very easy. Slow VT is just sustained VT, but at a relatively slow rate, usually less than 150 beats per minute, but is still tachycardic. So it is common, for example, in patients taking antiarrhythmic medication like beta blockers or amiodarone, that when he developed VT, he developed VT with a rate slowing down the ventricular rate to 100 or 120 per beat per minute, but it is more than 100. So it may be easily missed in diagnosis, and sometimes the doctor may, for example, miss the diagnosis of slow VT because he may suspect that the patient just has sinus rhythm and he has wide complex due to structural heart disease, although he is in slow VT. And in most cases, the patient is hemodynamically stable or sometimes in elderly. He may not recognize that he has palpitation, so he may present, for example, with dyspnea or dizziness and the doctor doesn't recognize. So slow VT is easily missed in diagnosis. For example, here we can see VT with a rate of 120 beat per minute, but it is not sinus rhythm and of course it is not as it use apparency, so this is called slow VT. It is not either because the heart rate is above 100 beat per minute. Ventricular flutter is an uncommon terminology to be used, but you need to be familiar with in order that when you see it in literature, you are not confused. Ventricular flutter means there is continuous sine wave pattern of the ventricular rhythm with no identifiable P waves or T wave. Rate is usually extremely high, more than 200 P per minute, and usually, of course, due to this rate, he would be hemodynamically unstable. So in this example here, the same like an itra flutter in which we mentioned that there is no isoelectric line in between the flutter wave, the same here. It is an extreme form of VT with loss of isoelectric line in between the complex. And of course, ventricular flutter is usually short-lived and usually degenerate into VF. So once you see this pattern, it is of course straightforward VT and it is a specific pattern called ventricular flutter and you need to give immediate DC shock in order to terminate this VT. Pulseless VT is a clinical term rather than just an ECG diagnosis because it depends on presence of VT with regular Y complex pattern but the patient has no epical or carotid pulsation and so this patient has cardiac arrest. That's why pulseless VT is one of the two examples of the shockable rhythm in algorithms for cardiac resuscitation. So pulseless VT in the ECG, you would just see VT, but the patient here is not hemodynamically stable or not hemodynamically unstable. The patient is gasping and the patient is in cardiac arrest. So pulseless VT is an ECG and term and combined with clinical diagnosis because the patient has VT on his ECG and the patient, the same example, he has no cardiac or epical Beats, and so pulses VT is a type of cardiac arrest. Of course, to our last example, which is a very malignant and very important type to recognize, which is ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation, of course, is the other example of the shock of rhythm causing cardiac arrest. And ventricular fibrillation is characterized by presence of irregular undulating chaotic rhythm with absence of organized complex. You cannot see any organized or well-defined complex in the ECG strip. And so the patient has no apical or carotid pulsation. Ventricular fibrillation, of course, is very important to recognize because in this case, the patient is in cardiac arrest and needs immediate cardiac compressions and immediate preparation of the defibrillator to give DC shock. So ventricular fibrillation is completely distinct from VT. So at the end of our lecture, we understand today the mechanisms of VT and we understand the various patterns of VT in clinical practice. We classified VT according to the duration, 
according to the mechanism, according to the complex morphologies, and according to the clinical presentation. And we discuss the peculiar types of ventricular tachycardia or other distinct type from ventricular tachycardia. And our take home message today still why complex tachycardia is VT until proved otherwise the same take home message like in the last lecture and it can present in various pattern as we discussed today monomorphic versus polymorphic sustained versus non-sustained slow rate like slow VT but still tachycardic regular versus irregular atypical versus typical bundle branch block morphology thank you very much for your listening